the body of water from which the cry of distress comes more often for a square mile than any other body of water in the world. It is not the Devil Sea off Japan, the tumultuous waters of Cape Horn, nor the deadly calm of the Sargasso Sea. It is an area where the search and rescue capabilities have no equal. Not the Bermuda Triangle, but another triangle. A triangle formed by the Great Lakes, locked in the heart of industrial North America. Too often, the crack search and rescue units of Canada and the United States come back empty-handed. A ship or a plane vanished for no apparent reason or destroyed by forces no one can explain. An extraordinary statistic has been recently disclosed. Fully one-third of all the unsolved American air and sea disasters take place in the Great Lakes Triangle. This series presents information based in part on theory and conjecture. The producer's purpose is to suggest some possible explanations, but not necessarily the only ones, to the mysteries we will examine. The man who has accumulated and assessed the data that has led him to designate the Great Lakes as perhaps the greatest disaster area in the world is J. Leland Gourlay. Jay Gourlay is not only an experienced author and journalist, he is also a highly qualified professional flying instructor. I've flown thousands of miles through the Bermuda Triangle, and I've been out of radio contact with anyone there for as much as an hour at a time. It's much easier to understand how someone could disappear in a vast expanse of ocean like that than here, where you can see Canada off our right wingtip and the United States off our left wingtip. I can overfly this lake in less than 10 minutes. No one is ever out of radio contact here. We can communicate with at least 100 different government employees in the United States and Canada right now. It's inconceivable that anyone could disappear here. And yet, disappear they do, and under circumstances of mystery. 50 mile an hour headwinds that no one else feels, dangers that come so suddenly the victim never even cries for help. In terms of the sheer magnitude of tragedy, Gourley has discovered that the Great Lakes surpass the so-called Bermuda Triangle. And the Bermuda Triangle covers some one and a half million square miles, 16 times the size of the five Great Lakes combined. These are not strange remote waters or vast stretches of ocean. These are completely enclosed freshwater pools the playground of middle America. On the shores of the Great Lakes stand the great American cities of Chicago, Detroit, Buffalo, and Cleveland. Piercing the sky over Toronto, on the shores of Lake Ontario, the highest man-made structure in the world, the CN Tower stands as the ultimate pinnacle of highly sophisticated communications technology. Vector Traffic flight. controllers urge pilots flying the lakes to report continuously to ground stations. A 10-second lapse will launch full-scale search and rescue. And yet, the fact remains that there is high incidence of inexplicable disaster. Jay Gourlay assiduously follows up any clue, any lead which may shed light on the mysterious tragedies. He has pursued high government officials in Washington and Ottawa. Interviewed the men on the spot, the highly skilled search teams operated by the police and the Coast Guards of two nations. He has spent days at the marinas to discuss the weather peculiarities with yachtsmen whose lives depend on their knowledge. What's the worst thing that can happen in a situation like that? 
He has fed his voluminous documentation gathered over two years into the highly sophisticated computer banks at such electronics nerve centers as the University of Toronto, searching for patterns, searching for correlations, searching for explanations. Stop it right there if you would. Oh, okay. That's the accident I was telling you about just off Milwaukee. That aircraft was at in route altitudes. It was talking to air traffic control. Uh, it was a clear day, very calm. The aircraft disappeared from radar from an altitude of about 5,000 feet. No trace of that airplane or anyone aboard it has ever been found to this day. And finally, not dry data, but flesh and blood. Eyewitnesses who survived to describe their bewilderment. Such a man is Robert Joy Jr. of Michigan, a policeman, a pilot, and a professor of criminology. On April 23rd, 1973, Bob watched his father vanish. His father was flying a safe, well-equipped amphibious aircraft. Is there any difference between this airplane and the airplane your father disappeared in? No, it's exactly the same type of airplane. Bob Joy was in another plane a few hundred feet away. They were over shallow Lake Erie. The water was not rough. There was no cry for help. I got a radio message from my dad, and I couldn't understand what he said. Uh, the frequency that we were on was uh, 122.8, the Unicom frequency. It's very congested. So I looked back out the right side of the airplane and I didn't see the Lake Amphibian at all. It had been there right along through the whole trip. Uh, no, seat no trace of the Lake Amphibian was ever found. The disappearances of small aircraft are hard enough to explain. The strange disasters of the Great Laker boats are perhaps even more mystifying. These are ships that are built for lakes, never far from shore, massively equipped with every conceivable safety and communications device. When the Edmund Fitzgerald was launched, it was the largest of the Great Laker boats. When she sailed from Duluth, Minnesota on November 9, 1975, she too was sailing safely in tandem with another Laker, the Arthur M. Anderson. They easily weathered a mild storm, but to be safe, the Fitzgerald checked her speed to close the distance between her and the Anderson. A snow flurry obscured their view briefly, but the radar told the Anderson that the Fitzgerald was less than nine miles ahead. When the flurry lifted, the Anderson could see for 20 miles, but there was no Fitzgerald. She'd gone with a sudden convulsion to the bottom with all hands. When the wreckage was found, it was discovered that every lifeboat was still securely fastened. The peculiar thing about that accident is that for three hours at least, the Edmund Fitzgerald was slowly filling up with water. We know that now, even though no one on board the Fitzgerald knew it at the time. What's really strange about this accident is that no one did know that. No one put on life jackets. No one called for distress. In fact, up until about one minute, before the Fitzgerald finally went under the water, the, the first mate of the Fitzgerald was saying that the ship was all right. They were having no problem. And what of the Kamloops and the strange events of December 7th, 1927? The Kamloops, too, had plotted a cautious course, entering Lake Superior in tandem with the freighter Quaydock. In the late afternoon, the men on the Quaydock sighted rocks ahead and swerved successfully to starboard to avoid them. The Kamloops was following and could clearly see the Quaydock's action. But the Kamloops sailed on, despite frantic warning blasts from the Quaydock's great steam whistle. She was not seen again. It was presumed she was dashed on the rocks of Isle Royale. But there was no wreckage, no bodies, no evidence whatsoever that the Kamloops had ever existed. Jay Gourlay's search into the strange history of the lakes led him back into the exhaustive records and preserved evidence of Great Lakes shipping kept at the Marine Museum on Toronto's waterfront. Exactly the same spot. And they, Though contemporary they, events they, first aroused my interest in this region, research quickly led me into these records of the 18th and 19th century. We know, for example, that the first commercial vessel to sail on the Great Lakes 
the griffin, and all aboard her, vanished on her maiden voyage. From relics like these, we know precisely what has caused most shipping accidents. But this is not always true in the Great Lakes. Often, evidence is contradictory. Other times, evidence is totally non-existent. There is, for example, an exquisite ship's figurehead found adrift. But there is no record of any ship ever carrying this figurehead. During the winter of 1902, divers searched unsuccessfully for the wreckage of the Bannockburn. They were not surprised because they could not believe that she had sunk. She was last spotted by a passing ship. She was pointed out by the skipper to his mate. But when the mate turned his head to look at the proud vessel, the Bannockburn was gone. From time to time over the years, she has been reported sailing on over the lakes. And then there were the wrecks that were only too painfully evident. But the phenomenon that destroyed them vanished as suddenly as it came. The Layfield, the James E. Davidson, the Hebu, the Sakem all proceeding through relatively calm waters when a single gigantic wave struck them down. A mountain of boiling water rising for one tumultuous moment. Meteorologists call them a seiche wave, but cannot explain them. They were first recorded in the Great Lakes in 1872. They are not caused by wind. The bizarre events of the lakes go back beyond the first records of the white man. The so-called Seish wave is part of the legend of the Chippewa Indians of Lake Superior. They still speak of Nanabazhu's sturgeon, a monster fish that with a flick of his tail was said to destroy the mightiest vessel. Indian legend is connected to another extraordinary case history. The ship was called the Wabuno, an Algonquin name for black magician. On November 20th, 1879, a doctor's wife claimed she had a vision of the ship's destruction. It was assumed she was hysterical. The wreckage was found in Lake Huron, battered by some tremendous force. But not a single body was ever recovered. But the growing legend of the lakes is not only based on misty tales of superstition. It is also based on cases that are all the more chilling because they are fully documented. United Airlines Flight 389, a Boeing 727, similar to this one. A flight from New York to Chicago, August 16, 1965. The facts are solid. The captain's voice was recorded by a traffic controller. The flight path was tracked on highly sophisticated NORAD equipment. There was no mechanical malfunction. Three highly qualified pilots were on the flight deck. They could see Chicago in the distance. The aircraft descended perfectly normally to 6,000 feet. It was then instructed to level out according to regular procedure. But the aircraft did not level out. It continued to descend for three minutes until it flew right into Lake Michigan. There was no, uh, no attempt to arrest the descent. It was a clear day just like this. In fact, up until one second before the United Airlines Flight 389 hit the water, killing all 30 aboard, the pilot was talking to air traffic control about his altimeter setting. He was looking at his altimeter, he was setting it, he was paying attention to his altimeter. The co-pilot was flying the airplane. He could see the water below him, he could see the city of Chicago in the distance there, about 15 miles away. In light of these facts, the National Transportation Safety Board concluded that no possible explanation can be offered for the action of this crew. No possible explanation. And yet, there is another case involving exactly the same elements. An altimeter charting a path to certain death. Right here is where Detroit Departure Control cleared the Sabre liner that was owned by General Motors to begin its approach into Pontiac. Up about five miles is where the Sabre liner began its descent. And beyond that, another two miles is where the Sabre liner finally crashed into the ground. At no time was there anything wrong with the aircraft itself. It was under full control of the pilot throughout the flight. 
Here, there is miraculously a survivor. He was the co-pilot that night, a man with vast experience and a spotless record, Howard Herbst. Uh, I believe it was something like this. They said, uh, you're cleared to 2,700 feet, cleared for the approach, contact Pontiac Tower at the outer marker. And 2,700 feet is the altitude for the procedure turn. So we descended the 300 feet to the 2,700 feet. That I know we were at. That's, I checked that altitude, and both of us did. Everything was going along smoothly. We were doing the checklist, and uh, when I got done with it, I saw the trees at the end of that checklist. Why then did he descend below minimums that night? Why did he fly that saber liner down into the ground? I have no idea, really. I, I wish I could answer it, but I, I don't. I, it just happened, and the next thing I knew, we were in the trees, but I, I have no, no knowledge of why or no answer. Howard Herbst has no answer, nor do the investigators who poured over the wreckage. To understand how baffling this is, one must appreciate how meticulous these investigators are and the elaborate technology at their disposal. For example, they can determine six months after an accident whether or not a tiny indicator light was lit on impact. Electronic microscopes tell these investigators whether there are scratches on a tiny metal part whether there are scratches on scratches, which might indicate a different sort of structural failure. A highly scientific examination of every piece of wreckage can reconstruct the state of an aircraft as it existed at the moment of impact. When the investigators finally conclude that the cause of a crash is undetermined, it can be assumed that the mystery is very real indeed. Not just civilian aircraft, but military aircraft. In 1956, the CF-100 was the backbone of the Royal Canadian Air Force. A reliable jet fighter checked out with military precision every time it left the ground flown by young men with the razor-sharp reflexes of the fighter pilot. On May 15, 1956, a plane like this took off over the Great Lakes. Only seconds after its last routine transmission, it disappeared off radar. It was subsequently learned that the pilot had dropped 33,000 feet to his death without uttering a single word of distress. Who was on that aircraft was here the other night talking to us about it. And, uh... In many cases, the circumstances are so mysterious as to give rise to theories that range from conservative scientific evaluations to fanciful speculations on the forces of outer and inner space. There appears to be, for example, a particular area of such heavy devastation as to be beyond the possibilities of coincidence. It is a line that extends, curiously enough, into the Bermuda Triangle. It is called the Agonic Line. No mechanical problems at all. The Agonic Line, or the line of zero magnetic variation, is the line along which magnetic north and true north are precisely the same direction. Now how this would be related to a transportation accident or how it could cause such a tragedy has never been explained. But the fact remains that a number of such disasters have occurred on or near this line. For example, the disappearance of Northwest Airlines Flight 2501, the disappearance of November 212 Alpha Delta, the implausible last actions of the Edmund Fitzgerald, in searching for explanations, Jay Gourlay meticulously examined 86 air disasters and 45 shipping disappearances. In many cases, the only possible explanations seemed to be outside the range of conventional wisdom. Some could be explained by the vortex theory, the so-called black holes where matter drops in and out of space-time continua. Then there's the fact that the Great Lakes have heavy deposits of iron ore, 
There are well-founded theories of the magnetic field of the Earth reversing itself, of magnetic earthquakes which could destroy navigational capabilities. In three cases, the disappearance of Northwest Airlines Flight 2501 over Milwaukee, the crash of a PA-22 into the shore ice of Lake Michigan, and the sudden destruction of the Edmund Fitzgerald, unidentified flying objects were independently and reliably reported in the disaster area. And so there are many theories. Strange atmospheric forces, electromagnetic anomalies, the agonic line, psychic forces, even the presence of UFOs. As for my own opinion, after two years of research, none of these theories is adequate. None of them is verifiable. Yet none can be discounted. Jay Gourlay continues to gather evidence, but as his search continues, the clues do not offer a ready explanation. In the heart of the Great Lakes is the mighty force of Niagara Falls, known as the Maid of the Mist. It is perhaps the most spectacular example of nature let loose. When men die here, there is no question as to why. The mystery is in the surrounding waters, where there is no apparent reason for sudden death. Stretching out a thousand miles from the Maid of the Mist, the Great Lakes Triangle is joining those other areas of mystery that form the tragic folklore of unexplained disaster.